in this first uh, installment, I want us to talk about what it means to develop a habit of enhancing our perspective. The habit of always being able to look at life with a better perspective. And so today, I want to ask that you meet me in the 16th chapter of 1 Samuel. If you would stand for the reading of God's Word. I know we get a lot of exercise here in New Sunlight. So if you stand briefly, I'm not going to read uh, chapters 16 and 17 in their entirety because we're really looking at both chapters, uh, but I want to zoom in, hopefully, on what can capture the essence of this sermon thrust for today. Amen. And I want to preach about, on this first installment of this series, Putting life into perspective. Well. Putting life into perspective. First Samuel, chapter 16, you will find a very familiar story, but I pray that you keep your mind open and your spiritual eyes open so that God can say something fresh to us uh, even today. I know a lot of times we look at this story, we think young people, we think youth day, but I, I pray that you would be open to what God can say to us regardless of our age, about what it means to put life into proper perspective. 1 Samuel chapter 16, and I want to just read one verse, verse 7. It says, The Lord said to Samuel, Do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Amen. You may be seated. <laughs> Go back and read chapters 16 and 17 in their entirety in your own devotional time, and that will help give context to what we just read. <clears throat> Putting life into perspective. Like most of us, <clears throat> I've always had a great affinity for that which is artistically and aesthetically pleasing to the eye. I still remember seeing the bike my parents bought me when I finally developed the ability to ride without training wheels. Well, When I looked at my older night rider bike, I was sad to see that what I loved so much now looked so beat up because I had fallen off of it, Chairman, routinely in my effort to learn how to ride. Yeah. Not long after, however, I came home and I was surprised to see that I had a new bike waiting for me in the garage. When I saw this newly sculpted and designed BMX bike that had a black frame with a glistening gold trim and big handlebars, I knew that I was going to look good riding down the street. <laughs> Many years later, when I saw the spellbounding woman, who is now my wife, sitting out in the congregation during a worship service, I immediately realized, brothers, that I would have a hard time focusing <laughs> well. on God, on the Bible, and on anything else that had to do with the Lord that day because she had captured and arrested my attention. Yes, sir. When thinking about the way our eyes function and how we, how what we see is connected to what we think and what we do, I remember an important lesson that I learned in my middle school art class in sixth grade. You see, we were instructed to take a picture, turn it upside down, and then draw it exactly as we saw it. This was perplexing and confusing for most of us at the age of 12 and 13, but I thought of it as an artistic adventure. I was prone to art. I was actually pretty gifted and good at, at artwork and drawing. And so I proceeded to draw 
And to my pleasant surprise, I drew the picture better upside down than I probably would have right side up. And so I asked how that was possible. The response was profound, which was that the mind often carries within it preconceived notions of what we think we know and what we think we see. And consequently, having to draw an exact copy of a picture upside down helps reconfigure the brain and remove any ideas about what we thought we knew about what we were looking at and force us to see every detail of that object. Well, it's a procedure that many art teachers will use when teaching young art students how to look with their eyes and not with what they already think they know they see. In other words, I ceased to draw what I thought I already knew and learned to draw what I actually saw. Well, All right. Come on as people of faith, we cannot afford to go through this life living according to what we think we already know. But we must learn to view our lives and look at our circumstances based on what faith allows us to see. I'm going to say that again. You and I, if we're not careful, will make the mistake of trying to walk through this life based on what we think we already know we're looking at. And we fail and forfeit to give God the ability and the opportunity to show us something new, something fresh, and something miraculous. You see, we cannot look at life through the lens of the world, but must mature to a place where we look at our lives through the lens of faith and through the prism of hope. We must see everything with spiritual eyes. And we must always, and if we don't look at that, we'll always be overwhelmed. We'll find ourselves bitter. We'll find ourselves intimidated. We'll find ourselves scared and frustrated and upset. Why? Because we're trying to look at life through an unspiritual lens. We walk by faith and not by sight. Yeah. We look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. unseen. Yeah. For the things that are seen are Trans transient, transient. Are, are in transition, are temporary, are fleeting. But the things that are unseen, somebody can help me, are everlasting eternal. and eternal. Yeah. Faith, somebody can help me right here, is the substance of things hoped for and what the evidence of things what? Not seen. Yeah. All right. You and I cannot look at the facts of life without putting faith with the facts. All right. All right. Yes, sir. Notice, I did not say ignore facts. I said you just can't walk through life only fixated on the facts, Elijah, that you see. Because if you only look at facts and don't add faith, you'll be frustrated, you'll be fearful, you'll be upset, You'll always be cussing people out. You'll always be giving people a piece of your mind. Come on and be honest. Don't look at me like you don't know what I'm talking about. You'll go through your whole life and you'll only see what your limited vision can see. Yeah. 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 That's right. All right. But somebody needs to hear me today. You've got to put your life, young brothers and sisters, into proper perspective. Grandparents, you and I, you, you all, I almost said you and I, you all. <laughs> Hopefully one day I'll get there. But whatever age we are, parents, grandparents, college students, young adults, high school students, it does not matter. You can be young and foolish and you can be old and foolish. All right. <laughs> See how some of us act right now? I think I offended some people with that. But I'm not here to soothe you. I'm here to convict you. You didn't call me to come make you comfortable. You called me to speak with conviction about what thus says the Lord. And my Bible says that you can't go through life based on what you look at with your natural eyes. Come on and help me. But you have to learn how to look at all your 
your problems, learn how to look at all your shortcomings, learn how to look at all your challenges, all of your hardships, all of your heartbreaks, all of your heartaches, all of your stomach aches, all of your headaches, all of your setbacks, all of the times you trip over your own feet and fall down and you still got to be able to see all that you're going through and still see God. Yeah! The stick. Right there. Because if you don't see God, Deacon Woodard, you'll commit suicide. Wow. Yeah. Wow. If you don't learn how to see God in the middle of all of your mess, you'll give up. You'll quit. Yeah. Yes, sir. And somebody here is about to quit. Oh. I'm preaching to somebody right now who's on the brink of saying, Lord, I've done all. Help him, Lord. But you've got to put life yes, sir. into perspective. Yeah. Yeah. And so, it takes spiritual eyes, watch this, to affirm God's presence when it's difficult to pinpoint him or understand what he's doing. Wow, good. That's all I could say. Yeah. We can really open the doors of church right now. <laughs> It takes spiritual eyes. Yeah. Thank Holy Ghost. We just had Women's Day. They talked about the diary of a spiritual woman. What was the verse? The verse says, you cannot go through this life, 1 Corinthians 2, and have an unspiritual mind. That's right. Yeah. And still discern Things what God is doing in the spirit. Right. Because those that do not have the spirit of God residing on the inside of them cannot understand spiritual matters. Yes, sir. Let me drive up in your driveway. Folk can't understand why you give and why you tithe, even though you're still broke at home. Yes, sir. Folk don't understand why you don't see the choir. Even though God may not choose to heal your family member. Even though God let somebody die before you had a chance to say goodbye. Even though you lost that child. Even though you lost your husband, lost your marriage, lost your career, and you're still here. And folk wonder, why in the world could this sister or this brother still have a smile on his face? How could she still have joy in her heart? How could she still reach down in her pocket and give all her money to that preacher, that pastor? Here's my baby, because I'm not living in life only with these, but I'm looking with eyes. Yes, sir. God told Samuel, how long will you grieve yeah. over Saul since I have rejected him from being king over Israel? I just want to stick a pin right there again. Be careful 
about holding on to stuff that God said let go of. Come here, young adults. Be careful about staying attached to somebody that God said walk away from. Speak, man. Come on, man. Be careful about building a life with somebody, about taking a career path, about doing things a certain way, and not evaluating the ramifications. Yeah. Because if God said go left and you still go right, you're going to end up miserable. Yeah. If God said let go and you're still holding on, you're going to end up upset. Yeah. But it's all about how you look at life. Because see, unlike humanity, God will not be consumed by the stature of a person. All right. At the expense of evaluating the spirit right. of a person. Yeah. And that's why I want to share with us initially that God has a strange way of elevating us. Yeah. Mm. When you put life into perspective, you find out initially that God has a strange way of elevating us. Well, Because in the text, after God makes it clear to Samuel that he has rejected Saul, he's got somebody else yeah. in store for yeah. Israel. And so we find out that he rejects Saul, first of all, because of his disobedience. You do remember, go back to chapter 15, you can read it for yourself. God instructed King Saul to destroy the enemy. Yep. He said, wipe him out completely, utterly, exhaustively, and totally. Do not leave anybody or anything left. Here's, here's what that meant. God was saying, I don't want a trace, I don't want a symbol, I don't want a remnant, I don't want spoils, I don't want anything for you to be able to look at and be reminded of the enemy. Somebody missed what I just said. God told King Saul, get rid of the enemy, get rid of all of them, and everything they had. Yep. Why, church? Because he didn't want them to constantly be tempted to look back at what that represented. That represented who was there. God was showing him who is here now. That represented the power structure that was in place. God said, I'm in charge. And Saul was disobedient. Yep. Saul decided, like some of us, <laughs> Saul decided not only to be disobedient, but to be dishonest and disingenuous. <clears throat> he, he kept some of the animals alive. He, he kept some of the spoils and then tried to turn around after disobeying and was disingenuous and tried to lie and then tried to stand before the prophet Samuel and before the presence of God and say, this is what I'm offering to the Lord. Mm. God said, I don't need what you offer. Sacrifice. Yes. The earth is the Lord. Yes. And the fullness thereof. Yes. God doesn't need what we offer. He wants us. Yes. So we hear that famous phrase, obedience, yes. Saul, would have been better than your sacrifice. Yes. So he was disobedient. He was dishonest. He was disingenuous. And therefore, he was disqualified. Yes. Saul was disqualified from leadership because he did not obey and he lied. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. You know why we have so much trouble in America in recent history? Because we got somebody in leadership who lies all the time. <laughs> Come on now. When you lie all the time, you start living a lie. Anybody ever lied so much? Come on, don't look at me like you never told a lie. You remember what you said, what you did when you were in college, and when you were, mm-hmm. You at homecoming, and you and Susie was was on one side of the football field, and brothers, you you saw you saw uh, Erica on the other side, and. <laughs> Sister, <laughs> Leroy was down, down yonder, as somebody was saying. But James was over here. James looked real good. 
So you lie. <laughs> We're laughing, but I'm trying to give you a humorous dose of something serious, which is if you lie and keep lying, you'll find yourself having to live the lie. what sin does. Sin always takes you farther go. than you intended to go. Yep. Yeah. Because when you start lying, you got to keep lying to keep the lie going. Yeah. And you got to keep the lie going so that you don't get caught. So now you're just lying. <laughs> Living a lie. <laughs> so he was disqualified from leadership. And yet there's a dedicated young man who's tending his father's sheep. And God wants us to put our life in perspective so that we can understand that he has a strange way of elevating us. That we don't have to lie wow. to be elevated. Amen. We don't have to trick anybody to be promoted. That you don't have to, to scheme and, and manipulate your way into being exalted. But God will lift you up He'll exalt you when you're humble. He'll lift you up. He'll elevate you when you're dedicated, when you're faithful. That's what David was doing because the text says in chapter 16 that he was tending his father's sheep. When Samuel said, now go get him and bring him in. Yeah. Because none of these sons of yours, Jesse, are going to be anointed today. I'm moving on, but all, I, all I'm here to say first of all is... Let God elevate you. And don't try to elevate yourself. If you're going to put life in perspective, understand this. God will elevate you when he's ready. All right. God will promote you when he's ready. God will exalt you when he gets ready. Because here's what I've learned. When God exalts me, there's nothing you can do about it. Yes, sir. Before, before the fall. The fall. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. Thank Holy Ghost. Don't think too highly of yourself. Yes, sir. <laughs> That's a sin we don't talk about a lot. Arrogance. Yes, love. We talk about salacious sins. And we talk about who got caught with who and where and when. But we don't talk about attitude that much. Yeah. Folks don't like when you start talking about attitude and, and the posture of your heart. Yeah. Come on now. God said, I'm looking at what's in your heart, yeah. not what you have on. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, sir. So if you're going to put life in perspective, you got to understand that when God is working, he has a strange way of elevating you. David was elevated while he was being dedicated and faithful yeah. at what his assignment at that time was. Right. Yeah. David did not come and schedule an interview to become king of Israel. <laughs> David did not put in an application to come be the king of Israel. <laughs> this isn't just for young people, this for us. David didn't sign up. David didn't apply. David didn't come looking for it. David was being obedient to his father. He was tending sheep. And they came and sent for him. Yes, sir. Woo. Yeah. Yeah. And how many know that God will bless your life in a marvelous way if you're willing to be faithful where he puts you where you are for right now. But if I can't be faithful here, then God can't trust me up here. If I'm not faithful before I get in front of you, I can't be faithful to you when I'm in your presence. If I can't be faithful to God when nobody's watching, I'm not going to be faithful to the Lord when all what was done in the dark's gonna come to the light. All right. So God has a strange way yes, sir. of elevating us. But then if we find out that God has a strategic way of equipping us. Good. He has a strange way of elevating us. Because David was just tending sheep. He was being faithful and he was exalted. But then we find out that keep reading the story, God has a very strategic way of equipping us. God is very intentional, very purposeful in how he equips us, how he develops us. Because the text says in chapter 17 that Saul looked at David and said to him, David, you're not able to go against this 
this Philistine to fight with him. Yes, sir. For you are but a youth. And he's been a man of war from his youth. But David looked at Saul, thank you, God, and said, King, your servant used to keep sheep. There it is again. I spent my time keeping sheep. Doesn't sound like much. But here's the here's the, the significance of that. He said, King, so when I was keeping sheep, doesn't sound like much. But when I was keeping sheep, doesn't, doesn't sound like much. But when I was keeping sheep, doesn't sound like it amounts to much. But when I was tending my father's sheep, doesn't sound like it, it's, it's worth anything, King. But when I was tending my father's sheep. I see where you're going, Doc. Yes, sir. Yeah. When I was at work on time, even though I was making minimum wage, yeah. when I would change clothes at McDonald's and head to Home Depot. Yes, sir. I see where you're going, Doc. Until God shows up. Yeah. All right. 
and then let him take care of everything when he gets there. See, here's what some of us do, and I, I gotta move on. Some of us want to be complacent and do nothing. And then when God does show up, then we want to take over and tell God what to do with our situation. Can anybody be honest and admit you've done that? Where you didn't feel like fighting anymore, so you just sat down. You just stopped fighting. But then when you recognize that God was about to come into the situation, all of a sudden now you had prayer requests and direction and stipulations and preferences. As if you were uh, picking what seat you want to fly on in the airplane. No, God says, fight until I show up. And when I show up, you won't have to fight anymore because the battle belongs to me. Yeah, yeah. somebody understand? Yeah. But you got to be willing to fight. Yeah. Yeah. It takes toughness. Yeah. It takes tenacity. Yeah. Here's a question. How long are we willing to fight? Uh -huh. Through some predicaments and problems in our lives, not knowing when or how God will show up on our behalf. How much are we willing to endure while we engage in the battles of our lives? Yes, David was equipped by God in this capacity because he engaged in life-threatening combat against wild animals with carnivorous appetites. Meat, they just, they had an appetite for meat. Flesh. And he had to do that in order to fulfill his duty of tending his father's sheep. And likewise, at times, life will require that we engage in spiritual warfare yeah. that will test out our faith and here it is reveal just how tough and tenacious we actually are yeah. because it takes tenacious faith to fight and do battle and strain and struggle and scratch and claw not knowing when or how God will intervene yeah. All right. Oswald Chambers said it this way Tenacity is more than endurance. It is endurance combined with the absolute certainty that what you are looking for is going to transpire. <clears throat> certainty that what you're looking for is going to transpire. Certainty, one more time, that what you're looking for is going to transpire. That's what tenacity is. You got to be able to look at your life and know. Think Holy Ghost. And we know mm -hmm. that not not something. Yes, sir. Not many things, but all things work together for those who love the Lord and come on and help me and are called according to His purpose. That's what we know. We know that in all. Persecution, distress, hardship, we are more than common. That's what I have to know. Yeah. If I have life, if I'm looking at life with the proper perspective. So that's why you and I can count it all joy. When we find ourselves in various trials. For we know that the testing of our faith produces steadfastness. And you got to let steadfastness have its perfect work. Perfect work. So yeah. that you may be perfect and complete, meaning mature, lacking nothing. nothing. Yeah. We've got to learn how to rejoice in suffering, knowing that suffering produces endurance. Endurance produces character. Character gives us hope. And know that hope will not put us to shame. Be steadfast, yeah. immovable, yeah. always abounding in the work of the Lord. You better get with me because this is about all I have today. Knowing that the Lord will, that your labor for the Lord will not be in vain. Yeah. I'm almost done. Yeah. So God developed toughness and tenacity. He was equipping David. Uh -huh. But he also provided David with some tools. He equipped David by developing his toughness, and he'll equip you by developing your toughness. But he'll also equip you by providing you with some tools. 
David had tools, watch this, that were suitable for him, here it is, to avoid injury whenever he was on the attack. Look, look back in the text, look at verse 30 through 40, chapter 17. Saul clothed David with his armor. Mm -hmm. He put a helmet of bronze on his head, clothed him with a coat of mail. David strapped his sword over his armor. He tried in vain to go, for he had not tested them. Mm -hmm. David has the king's armor on. Yeah. This is regal armor. Yeah. This is the best armor that anyone, any man in Israel could have. Yeah. King Saul's armor. Saul puts it on young David. David takes a good look at it. And says, King, thank you, but I can't keep this. Why? Because David already had the tools he needed. I wish somebody would go with me right here. Text says, verse 40. David said, I cannot go with these. All right. I have not tested. In other words, yeah, David call. said, I have no experience, King, with your weapons. I have no experience with your armor. Have you ever noticed that whenever you try to be like the world and you're a Christian, that it ends up blowing up in your face? Well... Okay, I guess I'm the only one who's going to be honest today and admit that there's been some days I felt like cussing somebody out. <laughs> Not cursing, cussing. <laughs> Don't look at me like you cussing somebody. To be honest, I say you, you did that last week. And you pray to God every night right now. Lord, help me in my mouth. Yes. Because when you try to live life like the other folk that you see who have no business, who have no interest in church, have no desire to get close to the Lord, they're just doing it the only way they know how. When you try that, you will always lose. Right. Right. You can't get into a fight with somebody that's fighting with different weapons and try to use their weapons and be victorious. All right. Wow. So David's awareness allowed him to maintain his advantage. Watch this. David would have forfeited his advantage if he was not aware. Some of us go through this life and think that if we take on somebody else's tactics, somebody else's weapons, somebody else's personality, somebody else's way of doing things, somebody else's approach to marriage, somebody else's approach to family, somebody else's approach to finances. If I look on television and get all of my lessons on marriage and family and children from whoever I'm watching on the sitcom, some of us think that that's going to help us and bring us joy. Yeah. Mm -mm. But you soon find out uh -huh. you can watch entertainment, yeah. but you can't live the entertainment. Yeah. I wish somebody would catch that. Yeah. You can watch entertainment, yeah. but don't try to live yeah. entertainment because you'll find yourself frustrated. You'll be coming home expecting your wife and your husband to do what you saw somebody on television do. <laughs> <laughs> Not realizing and remembering when the show ended, that's when the entertainment ended. All right. You still live at home. And the actors have gone on about their business. They told their jokes, they did their show, and they walked off the set with a nice check. And you at home mad. Because you thought you could do what you saw Mr. So-and-so, Sister So-and-so do. You thought you could come home and talk to your spouse or your children like you saw on the show. That's the show, baby. That's not real life. Yeah, yeah. And even if it's reality TV, it might be real, but it's skewed. Because they only show you what production wants you to see. That's right. Y'all act like you never watched reality TV show? Yeah. Young adults, y'all know this. Everybody under 40 is going to know this. Y'all ever watched Love and Hip Hop? Yeah. T 
even some of the kids are aware of what love hip hop is, right? Brother Dotson, they know. They know. So we ain't, we ain't, we ain't like we have to act like we don't know what it is. See, every year on Love and Hip Hop reality show, they have what they call reunion. And see, what they do is they come back, and what they do is they show addition, they show previous and sometimes additional footage that they didn't show you while the show was being filmed. Just to give you a fuller perspective right. on what really was going on. Right. Because when you were watching it and laughing and crying and, and cursing at the television and, and talking about, oh, you need to leave him and leave her, they didn't show you everything else that happened behind the scene. And if you're not careful, you will attempt to live your life, I'm almost done, not knowing that you haven't seen everything. You've got to use the tools God has given you. God gave David a sling, yeah, yeah. some stones, yeah. and a staff. Yeah. And David's awareness allowed him to maintain his advantage. Why did he have an advantage? Because David's size, stature, and strength did not compare to Goliath's. Goliath was nine and a half feet tall, 450 pounds heavy. And David recognized that as good and as regal as King Saul's armor and weapons were, they were not suitable for him against Goliath. All right. You and I must know what kind of battle we're in. David knew that Goliath's advantage was in his size, in his stature, in his strength, and that Saul's armor and weapons were designed for hand-to-hand -hand combat, which favored Goliath. David also knew his advantage was in his speed, his elusiveness, his agility to strike not up close, but from a distance. Yeah. All right. How many of you are trying to fight your battles up close when God says stay at a distance? All right. yeah. Yeah. How many of you keep getting jabbed in the forehead because you keep walking right up to the joker? Yeah. <laughs> now, I'm not being trite about domestic abuse. I'm talking about the reality. If I'm not talking about a person because there's only one adversary. That's Satan. Yeah. This is spiritual warfare. They told us we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against powers, principalities, spiritual darkness, and wickedness in high places. Mm. Mm -hmm. Like the White House. Yeah. <laughs> wickedness and corruption in high places. Where folk So you cannot walk into the battle trying to jab your way through and God said, pick up your sling. Get your stones. And when I tell you, run from a distance and strike. And you trying to sit there in the box. Don't you know that if Satan could, could get close to Jesus and, and Jesus had to endure Satan's temptation? Who do you think you are? Who do I think I am? Get past, get over on Satan. Yeah. Hmm. Some folks do a whole lot of singing and talk about what they're going to do to Satan. <laughs> Let's give Satan a black eye and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> You're not giving Satan no black eye. Don't get mad at me, just be glad. Smile. You're not giving Satan a black eye. No, what you can do is you use God's word and you talk to Satan. Yeah. When, you, when, when, you, when you feel like Satan's taking over your mind and you got thoughts that are dark and, and, and depressing and you're consumed with uncertainty and conflict and frustration and when you feel like giving up, when you feel like throwing in the towel, you've got to be able to read your Bible and say that greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. You've got to be able to say Well, you know, say that because you have tools just like and weapons just like the enemy does. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, Paul says, but spiritual and mighty for the pulling down of strongholds. Do you know some, what some of our problems are? Consist of 
stronghold. Some of us are holding on, actually being held on by strongholds, mental strongholds, emotional strongholds, the strongholds of anger, the strongholds of hypocrisy, the strongholds of resentment, the strongholds of bitterness, unforgiveness. That's a stronghold. When you walk around and you don't forgive anybody, but you want everybody else to be understanding of you, that's a stronghold, baby. Yeah. All right. Yeah. <laughs> it's a stronghold. When you always see everything negative but can't see anything positive, that's a stronghold, brother. You got to put your life into the proper perspective. We cannot afford to trade in our intelligence and wisdom for somebody else's foolishness. We cannot afford to exchange principle for other folks' pettiness. Mm. We cannot afford to diminish our integrity in order to keep up with somebody else's indulgence. We cannot afford to forsake righteousness in order to enact revenge. We cannot do what everybody else does because as a child of God, we're not everybody else. Pretty much. All right. We are not better than anyone else, but we're called to be different and set apart from everybody else. Come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Be holy because I'm holy. And remember that the Heavenly Father to whom you pray has no favorites. He will judge you and reward you according to what you do. So you must live in reverent fear of Him. God has a strange way of elevating us. God has a strategic way of equipping us with tools and with toughness. But I close with this. God has a supernatural way of enabling us. God has a supernatural way of enabling us. Because we see a response to the haughtiness of the enemy in chapter 17. Those first 11 verses. We see that God responds through the actions of David. To the haughtiness of Goliath. Goliath stood and shouted, Why have you come out and draw from battle? Am I not a Philistine? Are you not servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourselves. Let him come down to me. If he's able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our servants. And the Philistine said, I defy the ranks of Israel this day. Give me a man. You hear that again? I'm going to come back to that. That we may fight together. And when Saul and all Israel heard these words, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. You had a bunch of grown men that were scared. And you had a young man that was bold. You had a bunch of grown men, brothers, that were scared. Because they saw a nine and a half foot giant that weighed 450 pounds and they were afraid. If you were in your right mind, you would have been afraid too. <laughs> but see, and I'm done, David knew something these other brothers hadn't tapped into yet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because we already said that he had spent time being toughened up. When he had to fight on behalf of the sheep. Yeah. yeah. So remember, if you go back, he told Saul to be from the same yeah. of the lion yeah. and the paw yeah. of the bear. Yeah. That's the same way. Yeah. Somebody can help me close. Yeah. That God's going to deliver me yeah. from this giant right here. Yeah. Yeah. Well. Yeah. David knew that he and Goliath both possessed their own skill and prowess. But that only God was sovereign in power. David knew that he had prowess and that Goliath had prowess. But only God possessed power. And you've got to be able to look at Goliath in your life. 
You got to be able to look at whatever you're dealing with in your life. And you got to be able to see that as bad as it looks, when you put life into perspective, God still has power. Yeah. God always has more power than what your problem can do to you. God always has enough power to see you through your problem. God always has enough power to help you endure and overcome your problem. God always has enough power to help you get through and get by and be triumphant and be victorious. And that's why David said, you come to me carrying a sword. Yeah. You come to me with a spear. You come to me with a job. But I come, yeah. But I come. Yeah. Yeah. Somebody can help me right here. I'm done. David said, but I come in the name. With the name yeah. of the eternal one. Yes, sir. He's the commander. Yeah. Not just of the Israelite army. Yeah. Yeah. But he's the commander of the heavenly army. Yeah. Yeah. He said, you come with weapons. I come in the name of somebody. Yeah. You come with what you have. Yeah. I come with who I know. Yeah. You come with what you can hold on to, and I come with who's holding on to me. You come with what you can use, but I come with who's using me. You come with what you can hold in your hand, but I come with the one that's got me in his hands. And as long as I'm in the Lord's hands, there's nothing you can do about what he will do with me. was the same God that told Moses when he asked who he should name when Pharaoh asked him who sent him. He told Moses, tell him, I am that I am sent you. It's the same God that looked on the Egyptian army and threw them into a panic when they tried to follow Israel across the Red Sea. Yeah. And when they saw the face of God, Scripture says, it threw them into a panic, into confusion, and they all ended up drowning in the very waters that stood still for Israel to walk through. It's the same God that woke you up this morning. It's the same God that started you on your way. It's the same God that gave you that job you have. Then God hadn't really done too much for you. So I'm not talking to anybody that knows that God hadn't really done too much in your head. Because I don't expect you to respond at all. But if I have anybody here that knows that you know for yourself.
We're going to stop right there. Yes, sir. I ask that anyone who can't stand can stand.